Good morning, Village people. I'm Chris, and I'm excited to be in worship with you this morning. Go ahead and let us know who you are, where you're watching from in the comments. As we get started, if you are new with us, or maybe you've been here a little while and would just like to learn more about us, we would love to connect with you. So go ahead to this link, or if you're watching with us online, just scroll down and fill out our Connect card. If you do that, we'll have a gift for you, and we can't wait to get to know you more. Now this morning, if you're watching on YouTube, you can click that subscribe button as well as that bell icon to make sure that you won't miss anything that we share here on our YouTube channel. Today is entering into the last week of Lent and it is also the last week of our This Is The Way series and Pastor Travis will be leading us through what Jesus has set out before us as the way and how we can be better disciples of Jesus. Here at The Village, our vision is to connect people who feel far from God or disconnected from the church with a community of Jesus followers. And so what better way to do that than worship? Be here now, be present, set aside your distractions, and find ways that you can interact with this experience and be open to how God is at work and expectant to having an encounter with him. Let's pray. Lord God, please be with us now as we enter into this time of worship. Surround us, let us hear your voice, let us see your face. Let us be open to what you have to say to us today and be forever changed by having an encounter with you. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Kings and kingdoms will bow down Every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fire world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him so open up the gates make way before the king of kings Set the captives free For who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power And fighting our battles Every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sin of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow Before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow Before Him Who can stop the Lord Almighty Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? It is so good to be gathering with you in worship this morning. Next week is Easter, and with Easter, we will be gathering for 
two in-person drive-in outdoor services at 9 and 10.30 over at Osborne Park, as well as online for a service at 9 a.m. We would love for you to join us, but not only that, we'd love for you to invite others to join you and your family. Who can you invite to experience the joy and hope of Easter at either our online service, our in-person, or maybe even in your backyard or your home to watch with your family? If you'd like to join us for our drive-in services, you can head to thevillagenashville.com slash Easter. There you can RSVP to make sure that we are prepared to welcome everyone who comes to those services. Another thing we do every Easter is we give away 100% of our Easter offering. This year, we are partnering with Waterfor to bring 5,000 people in the city of Waterloo, Sierra Leone, safe water access. That would cost $30,000 to put the system in place. And luckily for us, and by the grace of God, we have an outside donor that's going to match 100% of our Easter offering, which means $30,000 can turn into $60,000, and 5,000 people with water access can turn into 10,000 people with water access. If you'd like to join us in this initiative, you can do that in three ways. First, just check in with The Village on Facebook or on Instagram. For every check-in we receive, we'll donate to Water4, and that will money will be matched. Second, if you haven't already and you're new with us or would like to learn more about us, fill out a Connect card. You can do that at thevillagenashville.com slash connect, or if you're watching with us online, just scroll down and find that form. For every new Connect card we receive, we'll donate $5, and that will be doubled to $10. The third way is go ahead and text Village Nashville, all one word, to 77977. It'll take you to our secure giving platform where you can click Water 4 from the Dropbox and you can donate there. We are so excited about the ways that we are partnering with Water 4 and how that speaks to our vision and our mission. And today, we get to hear from a family that has a special connection with Waterloo. It's the Coggin family. Let's watch that now. I'm Mark Coggin, and uh, my wife Amy and I have been at the Village since the beginning. Between Amy and me, between 2010 and 2013, we, we made several trips to Sierra Leone, um, not starting out for adoption, but it turned into an adoption process. And uh, ultimately, one of our sons, David, who, who was known as Umaru at the time, uh, he, he's from Waterloo in, in Sierra Leone. And so Mark was able to visit Waterloo, visit David's family, um, see the village, see the area of town, and then also meet the people who were related to David. So it was a really neat experience. And that was in 2013. When I went to Water Waterloo, uh, I guess I probably really saw what some of the country was about. And um, in the villages, there is no running water. And even the things that, um, might have been minor inconveniences in Sierra in Freetown, such as you know cold water showers. You wouldn't have showers available to you, or you wouldn't have um, you know ease of of having clean running water and uh, to fix food and to to do the basic necessities. You know, water is it's like oxygen for the body. It's it's an absolute basic necessity. Uh, but you go and you see what the people in the villages have to do for water and whether it's uh, just tapping into the city main uh, if there is one and just you know doing their clothes in the, the side of the ditch uh, at that point or um, just having to boil water for basic necessities and uh, you just you know I'm, I'm no medical expert but you just see this and you know that there's uh, any number of disease and, and challenge and just you, you don't it's hard to um, to explain how basic that is and how it's not there. I traveled to Tanzania with a group from the village. Um, we had donated an Easter offering through Water 4 and we were looking forward to seeing the well there that we were a part of installing and seeing that come to fruition. Um, as far as the water goes, the work with Water 4 First of all, I was just so impressed with the way that they really work within the confines of the community and they try to empower the people that they're with. 
They don't come in and say, we have an answer, this is what we're going to do, but they really work with the resources that are available and try to and try to see what their solution might be, obviously giving, given new resources. Thinking back to my trip to Tanzania, um, when we were in a village and we were meeting with people, so often people of the village would stand up and give what they call their testimony. And just to give us an idea of what this well, this clean water was going to mean for them. And over and over and over again, um, we would hear that they had prayed to God for clean water and now it had come. I think it's easy for us to forget that he does that through people. And so we were the answer to their prayer. They prayed to God for clean water and we were able to be that answer for them. I think that through clean water, through um, Water Four's mission to spread the gospel, it creates the opportunity to say, we did this because God loves you and we love you. Global missions are not any more or less important than local missions, uh, but it's been laid on mine and Amy's heart over the years to, to uh, plant there in many ways. And it's not just Sierra Leone, we've had a number of trips uh, Amy to Tanzania and to Kenya, I've been to Togo, and that's a special place for us in large part um, because the need is so great. I think it's important for us to participate in global missions because God loves the whole world. The way that He loves the whole world is through His people. And unfortunately for the people in Africa or the people in Waterloo specifically, they just do not have the resources available to provide their own clean water. If they did, they would. And so it takes the people like us who are in a position to help to be that answer to prayer. And I feel like God calls us to love his people and to love our neighbor. And he doesn't define who that neighbor is. And it could be the person in Nolansville or it could be the person in Waterloo, Sierra Leone. To me, our neighbor is who we come across and have the ability to help. So it's, it's really neat to see, it's been neat for me to see the heart of God in people that don't look like me and don't have any, any upbringing or um, hardly anything in common from my experiences, but they have everything in common from the makings of, of uh, God. And... So the fact that the village may be surrounding Waterloo and bringing water to that community to me is just an amazing um, not coincidence, but miracle. Um, you know, we were we were blessed enough to bring David into our family and provide opportunity for him, but there was a whole community there that he left behind. And included in that community was his biological family. And so the idea that we may be able to give back to that community that goes beyond David and beyond our family is just really amazing. I think when you hear the term the village and um, I think of the villages in Sierra Leone and in third world countries, in, in many ways, what defines that village is simply community. And um, David was raised by his extended family for five years of his life. And, and not just his extended biological family, but people in that village are the community. I think by partnering with Water 4, we continue to live into our mission of being a church for the community because God's community does not stop at Nolensville or Brentwood or Tennessee. God's community includes the whole world. Well, hey, village people and family and friends. My name's Travis. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Before I dig into our scripture passage this morning, I just want to remind you, and I'm so excited about this, that we are one week away from Easter. And so next Sunday, we're going to be celebrating an outdoor Easter service at Osborne Soccer Park, south of Nolensville at 9 and 1030. Still lots of spots available. You can sign up. Of course, we will still be here online as well to celebrate Easter next Sunday. And so no matter how you're planning to do that, whether you're going to be in person with us or you're going to be online here with us, I can't wait to celebrate Easter with you. 
We also really want you to invite the people that you know. I know that over the course of the past year, a lot of people have lost connection with other people. We've had a lot of new people move into the community who are looking for a place to connect and you might be the conduit for them to make that connection. And so I wanna encourage you and challenge you as much as I can, as strongly as I can, to make sure you're inviting friends and family and new neighbors to join us for Easter next week, either in person or online. And don't forget, I'm so excited about this, that we're giving away 100% of our Easter offering to our partners at Water4, and we're trying to bring clean water to 5,000 people in Waterloo, Sierra Leone. You just saw a video about that just a minute ago, and it's amazing that we've got such a connection with our church with what's happening there in Waterloo. And so I hope you'll be part of that and give generously. We've got a big goal for our family over the next week. And so I wanna challenge you to set a big goal as well. Our big goal for the church, again, is $30,000. And there's an outside donor who's gonna match every dollar that we give. And so I'm hoping we're gonna blow our goal out of the water and every bit of that will be matched. So next Sunday, Easter, be there or be here and let's give generously to make a big impact in Waterloo, Sierra Leone. I wanna pray for us and then we'll get started with this scripture today. Let's pray. God, we love you and thank you. I thank you for who you are, for the ways that you're at work. And God, I pray that no matter what it is that we're facing right now, whether we've had the highest of highs this week or the lowest of lows, or we're just somewhere in between. God, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of us a word that we need to hear. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the last Sunday of a series that we've been calling This is the Way. And over the past several weeks, we've been looking at the way of Jesus, the way that Jesus told his followers to go, the way to actually follow Jesus with our lives. And in case you haven't been with us, here's the uh, here's the Cliff's Notes version of the past six weeks. Some of you are like, well, why have I even been here for the past six weeks? But here's the Cliff's Notes. So we kicked off this whole thing by saying that the voice of God is in many ways like a GPS or the Maps app on your phone. And no matter where you turn in life, no matter where you go, God's voice is actively speaking to you and trying to guide you. And there's no place that's ever out of range. You can never get out of range for the voice of God to be able to reach you and to speak to you. In fact, in Isaiah 30, 21, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah talks about this and he kind of says it like this. He says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way, walk in it. So there's a story of Jesus in, in the Gospel of John chapter 14, and, and Jesus was with his disciples. They just finished eating their last meal together. Jesus has actually washed their feet, if you've heard that story. And they're, they're sitting at the table, and Jesus is sharing his last words with them just moments before he's arrested and put on trial and nailed to a cross. And in some of his last words to them, he says, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And then he says this, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. One of his disciples, a disciple named Thomas, spoke up and he asked the question that, that no one else was willing to ask. I guess you always need somebody like that in a group, unless the person asking about turning in homework. But anyway, Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. That sounds familiar. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Now, listen, Jesus doesn't say, I am the belief. He doesn't say, I am the argument. I am the option. He doesn't say, I'm the opinion. He doesn't say, I'm the thought that counts. He says, I am the way. And when Jesus invited his disciples to be his disciples, all throughout the New Testament, he used two words follow me. That's it. He didn't say, agree with me. He didn't say, think about me. He didn't say, study me. He didn't say, memorize me in Greek. He said, follow me. Learn to do what I do, and then you do it too. And so the intention behind the invitation is that the way of Jesus becomes the way of us. So the, the goal of discipleship is that over time, the way of Travis becomes more and more and more indistinguishable from the way of Jesus. 
and that the way of you becomes more and more and more indistinguishable from the way of Jesus. Dallas Willard, uh, in his book, The Divine Conspiracy, incredible book, he says that discipleship simply means becoming an apprentice to Jesus. And when you apprentice under someone, you're not just learning about them, you're learning to do what they do. He puts it really simply in his book, and I love how he says this. He says, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. And so the whole idea behind this series comes from the notion that you find all throughout the Bible, that following Jesus isn't just about having the right opinion or believing the right things in your heart, although that's important, but it's about listening for the voice of Jesus and then doing what it says. And so that means that the, the two most important questions a follower of Jesus can ask in any given situation or circumstance are these two questions. Number one, what is Jesus saying to me? And number two, how am I responding? The voice of God is, is always speaking. And so in anything, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your relationships, in your friendships, in that difficult situation at work or that difficult situation at school, you can ask these two questions. What is Jesus saying to me and how am I responding? And so in the past several weeks, we've talked about how to listen for the voice of God. We talked about the, the way of forgiveness and the power of forgiveness in our lives. We've talked about the way of the vine, which is the way of prayer, the primary way to stay connected to Jesus. We've talked about the way of the towel, which is the way of serving the people around you rather than looking to be served. And then last week, Pastor Julie talked about the way of the garden, where Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. And so today, I, I want to wrap up this series by pointing to the thing that Jesus warned us might get in the way of following him more than anything else. I mean, I, I think we're here, you're, you're online with us right now because we're trying to figure out what it means to follow Jesus in 2021. I mean, we are listening for God's voice. We want to hear it. We want to do what Jesus says. But there's one thing that gets in the way of us doing that more than anything else. There, there is one thing, Jesus talks about this, there's one thing more than any other thing that is causing it to be difficult for you to follow Jesus. It's something we've all got. It's something that's underneath everything we struggle with in life. It's something that's a barrier or a hurdle for all of us. It's universal. If you go to work, you have it there. If you go to school, you have it there. It's there in the middle of every single one of your relationships. It's in your marriage. It's in your parenting. It's been part of any and every significant decision that you've ever made and will ever make. The one thing that Jesus points to that is causing it to be difficult for you to follow him is your self. It's yourself. Think about it. You are the person that you get the most advice from. You are the one that you're around more than anyone else. You talk to you more than you talk to anybody else. And if you never used to talk to yourself, I bet it's a habit that you've picked up in the last year. I mean, the last year has made everybody start talking to themselves. You are the one who's the primary filter for all of your decisions. Your view of the world is the most impacted by you. <laughs> There's even a phrase that talks about this. You know this. I can be my own worst what? Enemy. Sometimes I am my own worst enemy. I mean, there, there are a lot of hurdles that you're going to face in life. There are a lot of barriers that can get in the way of following Jesus. Fear, anger, addiction, jealousy, selfish ambition, a, a love for status or money or stuff. But the one thing with more power and possibility to derail the mission of Jesus from fully operating in your life is yourself. And so if you want to follow Jesus and yourself is your biggest obstacle and you can't get away from yourself no matter how hard you might try, what do you do about it? Well, Luke chapter nine is kind of a turning point in the gospel of Luke. It starts with Jesus uh, praying in private with his disciples and it ends by saying this, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus set out resolutely for Jerusalem. So here's the thing. Jesus knows where this is all ending up. 
He knows that he's headed toward Jerusalem and he knows that there's a cross waiting for him when he gets there. And so while he's praying with his disciples at the beginning of Luke chapter nine, he tells them this, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self or their very soul? Notice what Jesus wants for the disciples here. He wants them to actually save their lives. He wants them to find life. He wants them to keep their soul and not lose it or forfeit it. The thing to remember is that the instructions of Jesus and the commands of Jesus are always for our good. They're not usually easy, but they are always good. And I think it's really important to remember that when facing some some difficult words from Jesus, that that's what he's aiming for. Rarely easy, but always good. I mean, following Jesus rarely takes you on the easy path, but it always takes you on the best path. And so with that disclaimer in mind, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to do three things. Here's the first one. If you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. If you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Can I be honest about something? I don't always like what Jesus says. Maybe I'm the only one. But Jesus says some things that that I really wish he hadn't said. And he, he says some things, some things that, I, that I just wish weren't in the Bible. He says, he says a lot of things that I wish I could ignore. And this is one of them for a number of reasons. Um, number one, I think this is really difficult to hear. I don't like the idea of denying myself. I mean, nothing about that sounds fun. But the second is that this flies in the face of what I think we're sometimes led to believe about Jesus. I see this play out in a lot of ways, but but it's popular, I think, in 2021 to think of Jesus as what I would call yearbook Jesus, right? Yearbook Jesus. Yearbook Jesus says, hey, I love you just the way you are. Reach for the stars. Yearbook Jesus says, following your heart is the most important thing. Yearbook Jesus says, don't ever change. Lilas you know, love you like a sis. Anyway, yearbook Jesus sounds incredible, except that it doesn't sound like Jesus actually sounded. The Bible tells the story of creation in in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and it says that you and I were made in the image of God and that the original design was good. But Genesis 3 introduces the concept of sin and the universal nature of sin, and sin is simply a distortion of the original design. And so so when sin was, was introduced into the world, it distorted our own ability to see the difference between good and evil and right and wrong on our own. I heard somebody put it like this recently, and as a parent, it kind of made me laugh out loud. Uh, he asked this question. He said, are people inherently good or inherently bad? So we asked that question. People had a lot of differences of opinion about it, but he said, I believe people are inherently bad. And then he said, let me ask you like this. I want to ask the experts in the room on this, parents. So if you're a parent, do you have to teach your kids to be bad or do they just naturally figure that out on their own? Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you've got to work to figure out the places where the design might be good, but maybe the wiring is faulty and you've got to personally take the responsibility to say no to yourself when what you want for you is inconsistent with what God wants for you. And he says, nobody else can do that for you. If you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Well, Jesus goes on. He he says, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross daily. Listen, again, Jesus knew where this was headed for him. So so the cross was not a surprise for Jesus. He wasn't caught off guard when he was arrested. The cross for Jesus was the epitome of his mission. It wasn't an afterthought. And so when Luke says that Jesus set out resolutely for Jerusalem, 
He's talking specifically about the cross. The mission of Jesus was the cross. The mindset of Jesus was the cross. And so when you read in Luke, take up your cross daily, what it means is take up the mission and the mindset of Jesus. And not just once, you have to do it daily. It is a daily choice to follow Jesus. It's not a one-time thing. It's not just something you did that one time when you were at camp and now you're good to go, right? Following Jesus isn't simply praying a prayer and asking for forgiveness and then, and then just kind of hanging out until you get to go to heaven. It is a daily choice that you have to make before you get out of bed. And then you've got to make it all throughout the day to take up the mission and the mindset of Jesus. The Apostle Paul talks about it in the New Testament letter of Galatians, and he says it like this. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And so I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily. And then this last one is my favorite. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you have to follow me. He says, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. And I think this is where the rubber meets the road in discipleship. This is, this is where we get in our own way. I actually think it's funny that Jesus felt like he had to spell it out like this, but he wasn't wrong. If you want to follow me, you have to actually follow me. And I just think about how many times have we all said, I want to follow Jesus, but we just never really got around to it. But this is the decision point for us. And it's a classic question. Do I want to be a follower of Jesus or am I just a fan? I mean, am I a fan and man, I'm cheering him on or am I in the game? Teddy Roosevelt, the, the former president, in one of his most well-known speeches, a speech that he gave after his presidency, he said this, I love this, maybe you've heard it. He says, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. If you want to follow me, you've got to follow me. So are you in the arena with Jesus? Or are you just watching from the sidelines? Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. In Luke 23, if you flip forward a few chapters, you see that what Jesus said would happen, happens. So as the week begins, Jesus and the disciples enter into Jerusalem. Jesus is greeting, greeted by adoring crowds, but, but just a few days later, the crowds abandon him and he's arrested and an angry mob calls for him to be executed and he's nailed to a cross of his own. And here's what it says in Luke 23, starting in verse 44. It was now about noon. And darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Praying that prayer is the way of Jesus. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That's not the prayer of a fan. That's the prayer of someone who is in the arena. A fan of Jesus prays, Father, into your hands, they commit their spirit. And, and I applaud that. It's so noble of them. I'm so proud of them. But a follower of Jesus prays, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And so as we're concluding this series, this is the way. That's the prayer I'm going to ask you to pray with me today. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I want to ask you right now to close your eyes. 
and take a deep breath. And I want to ask you to take a few minutes to silently pray that prayer. And whether you're praying it for the first time ever or the first time in a long time, or maybe it's the hundredth time today, let's just take a few minutes and pray that prayer silently together. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. God, help us to be like Jesus. We want to follow him. We want to know about him. We want to experience the life that he offers. But God, we, we confess and we admit that we are often our own worst enemy that so often we are the ones who get in the way of us actually following Jesus. And so today, God, help us to do the things that Jesus asked his followers to do. God, help us today to deny ourselves, to deny ourselves in the places where we are living inconsistently with the way that you would have us live. God, help us to have the courage and the strength and the power through the power of your Holy Spirit to take up our cross daily, to be all about the mission and the mindset of Jesus. And God, as we seek to follow Jesus, help us to follow Jesus. To not just talk about it, to not just cheer him on, but to step into the arena and to give our lives to you. And so we join Jesus in this prayer and we pray, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Father, into your hands, I commit my life. Father, into your hands, I commit everything that I have, everything that I do, everything that I say, and everything that I am. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in just a minute, we're going to be back for a time of, of prayer and communion. So if you want to step out, if you've got some bread and juice or water, we're going to share in communion together. So wherever you are, uh, whether you're sitting in your living room at home or you're, you're somewhere else throughout the week and you've got the opportunity to grab those things, I want to ask you to do that. We're going to come back in just a minute and, and have that time to pray and share in that together. But before we do that, um, we're, going to have, uh, we're going to have some music. And I want to invite you and encourage you uh, to sing with us, to join with us in this, uh, to, to kind of listen to the words and watch the words. And we'll be back in just a minute. He's coming on the cloud Kings and kingdoms will bow down Every chain will break As broken hearts declare his praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty Our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sins of this world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him Make way before the King of Kings The God who comes to 
safe is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? In fighting our battles And every knee will bow before Him Our God is the Lamb The Lamb that was slain For the sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb Every knee will bow before Him So this week is a week that's celebrated around the world in the Christian church. It's called Holy Week. It begins today with what's called Palm Sunday, when we remember Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and crowds gathered around and they waved palm branches and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the story goes on throughout the week. By Thursday, the crowds had thinned. It was just Jesus and the 12. Judas, one of his disciples, had already made arrangements to betray Jesus over to the authorities. And they were gathered around a table together, and they had what's known as the Last Supper. And when we share in communion, we remember that meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, and we remember its significance. And Jesus shared its significance with the disciples when he took bread and he broke it. And looking forward to the next day on Friday, Good Friday, he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. And then when the supper was over, he took a cup and thinking ahead to what was just ahead of him, he said, this is my blood. It's about to be poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so every time we share in communion, we're commemorating that night and that meal and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us. So in just a moment, if you've got bread and you're going to share in in communion with us, you can take that bread and break off a piece and say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. You can dip it in the cup and you can say, this is the blood of Christ. It's poured out for you. And then once you've done that, if you're gathered with some other people or if we're just one-on-one, we're going to share in a time of prayer. And I would encourage you, if you're with some other people, to stop, pause, 
and pray together, pray for each other. And if you're with us online, uh, we're praying together in real time in the chat and there are other people gathered all over the place who are praying with you. And so I'd invite you to just enter in prayer concerns that you have, things that are on your heart right now, things that you'd like us to be praying about together. And so as we prepare for communion and prayer, let me pray for us to open us up in that time. God, we love you and we thank you for who you are. God, I pray that right now you would send your Holy Spirit. For those of us sharing in communion, I pray that you'd send your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and the cup, that you would make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ to the world. And no matter where we are right now, God, no matter when we're tuning in, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. God, I, I pray now that you would continue to hear us, and God, that you'd open us up to hear you as we continue to pray.
Hey there, thanks so much for joining us today. If you're on YouTube, we want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button and click that bell icon so that you don't miss a thing coming up here at The Village. Be sure to also head over to thevillagenashville.com so that you can learn more about our church, get connected to a community of people following Jesus together, and learn how you can support the ministries of this church financially. We hope you have a great week.